I am Joe Puzzles by Joe, but um, I have an intro in a second here. So this talk, which we'll get to the title here too. Okay, so this is a quote from one of my um, fans that summed up the clutter games quite well, I thought. Um, says, you know what you'll get with each clutter game? It's always the same, yet each game is always different. That's the magic of the clutter series. that working oh there we go okay um, I've been doing this for 12 plus years and my 14 clutters to date has netted me about 1.7 million in those 12 years and the name of this talk is called out of the outing the grind finding the fun in game design clutter and life uh, this is my seventh SimFest talk and I am that's my email up there I am Joe Casava and I want to thank these guys. They've been doing this for uh, eight years, I think. I think I started the second uh, SimFest, and I've been talking to each one, I think, since. And um, I'm hoping this talk is like my games, that you sort of know what you're going to get with me, but um, hopefully this is very different from all my other talks. Okay. I put this caveat almost always in front of my talks. Um, hey, if it works for you, you know, when you listen to my advice, uh, use it. If it doesn't, don't. You know, this, um, this is basically is just saying you know what's best for you. Um, be careful when you take advice from anybody. Okay. Uh, this is just going to start with definitions of myself and sort of imply why you, sh why you might want to listen to me at all when it comes to game dev. All my life I've been the math guy. 42 years ago I became a programmer. 36 years ago a software engineer, which really isn't the same as a programmer. And I urge anybody who thinks of themselves as a programmer to, to figure out how to start thinking of yourself as a software engineer. Um, 18 years ago I one step up from software engineer as a knowledge worker. And that's where you can convince your boss that you know more about what you do than they do so maybe they ought to listen to you more. And that's a very useful thing to start thinking of yourself. 17 years ago, I became a game designer. Um, prior to the game designer, I had four years as a failed indie, but I didn't put that in the list because it's not something I continued to do. 13 years ago, I became an indie game developer. 10 years ago, I started thinking that I was really not quite just an indie game developer, but I was a true entrepreneur. And six years ago, I became what I think of myself as the curator of clutter, that, that I have a responsibility to the players of my game that have been playing it for about six years then to take care of them. Okay, so the main point of this talk is actually negative times a negative equals a positive. That if you remove a negative from your life, your life gets better. And a lot of people strive for that positive, but they don't look closely at their own life and whatever they're doing to figure out how to remove you know, the negative. And that's what the gist of this talk is. Removing the grind is a good thing. It was inspired by two things. Um, I worked for a company called iWin, one of my first, I did a Mahjong quest for them. And I got so sick of hearing the game designer at the time say, it's hard to find the fun in the game. It's, it's hard to find the fun. And I finally came up with an answer, which is how I, it's ma my main mantra as a game designer or developer. I say, sure, it's hard to find the fun, but it's easy to find the not fun and stay the hell away from it. I was also inspired by the movie Rounders where this guy's a nice safety player and he just grinds it out and the other players make fun of him. They say, you keep grinding out that rent money, Joe. It's noble work you're doing. As opposed to uh, somebody who plays poker and takes bigger chances and stuff. They make fun of him. Um, but I've never grinded it out. But I use this as an inspiration that there's a middle ground between being wild and crazy versus you know, safe and He's the grind, so. Okay, so that's Mahjong. 
That's what I wrote for um, for I win. And the elevator pitch for clutter would probably look like this today, which is Mahjong without borders. And the first thing you have to do is you you have to replace the um, the Chinese tiles with you know objects, and then you finally you get rid of the the objects entirely, and you don't have any really rules like Mahjong has. And that's what clutter became. So I'm going to show you my first clutter game, just for a minute. Not that long. That's enough. Um, it's a simple, they call it a hog pile. It's just a mass of objects, and you pick off two at a time. And then it's all the variations that I've added to that over the year. So the great clutter debate is, was it a $2 million genius idea or just $2 worth of good enough execution? And the real answer to that is, number one, ideas are a dime a dozen. You're never going to get me to say, oh, that was a phenomenal idea. You know, that's so much better than these ideas, that idea, or whatever. Because it is the execution that matters. However, the real genius idea to the clutter game is the fact that I thought a minor mechanic in an already existing game was worth exploring as a whole. And I think that's true of anything. I think later on I say, um, I don't believe there's any bad mechanic. There's only um, bad level design. And when that comes up again, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But I believe that this little thing of matching two things, a pile of objects, was worthy of exploration. And to me, that was the important um, idea. And again, worthy of exploration, worthy of my time and effort to put it in. The idea by itself, you know, not worth it. Everybody has ideas. You have to act on them. Okay. And at the time, I spent, I spent the last year or so at Mahjong pitching games, and I was so arrogant that I said, you know, pick a genre, any genre, and I'll do a game in it, because I got sick of pitching ideas and having them turn them down when I believed it was the execution that mattered. So I used to say this. So when it came to I had to do this on my own, can I do this on my own? I picked the genre that was most popular at the time, which was hidden object games. And then I couldn't do a full-blown hidden object game in the way that they were currently popular, so I figured out a way I could do it and appeal to those people without being a true hidden object game. And I actually did it so well that Clutter is considered its own subgenre of hidden object games. Okay, there he is, just reminding you. But I want to show you that doing clutter was not a grind because there was always tons of variations. And these are all from the 14 games in order. So there's a lot of variations. Uh, after I went to Unity, I found th these uh, really cool object sets that help. I figured out how to do clutter many, many different ways. Uh, Unity let me get into motion where all the earlier pictures were all these flat, you know, nothing moves on the, the screen other than the two objects you pick. In this one, all those three circles are rotating in, the, in Unity, and that's something I couldn't do under the old, old system. Um, I made my own object sets just to <sighs> make more puzzle games, more things that appealed to me that I felt I could push my audience towards. If I had put this in Clutter 1, uh, there wouldn't have been a Clutter 2 because they would have run from this in droves, but I earned trust over time, and now I could give them this abs abs sorry, abstract set, and they would uh, accept it. There's another one from later. I learned to, I can cut up any picture and make a puzzle from it. Um, these also rotate. These also rotate. Uh, this is just another nice little object set that I think early on they would have rejected, but now it makes a nice little, it even looks like Mahjong, but again, there's no rules, so you don't have to pick from the ends and stuff. Um, and now this is the trailer from my latest game that I'll just play for a half a minute. And uh, let's see if I can lower the volume. I don't know. 
if that'll work. May not. That's my latest object set, these dice that are just nuts. Another set of abstract tiles. Okay. Okay, so I started thinking back of what was the first time in my life I, you know, outed a grind. And um, it was actually in seventh grade. I've been a math guy my whole life. I walked up to my seventh grade math teacher after class one day and I said, I don't want to do the homework. He said, why? I said, you waste my time doing all the easy problems, and I'd rather work on the harder ones. You're wasting my time. He said, come see me tonight after, you know, after school. So I took the current chapter we were on, and I went to the, the ending puzzles, the ending, um, what are they called? They're not, not puzzles, um, examples or whatever. Um, anyways, you, uh, I worked them out, worked out the couple that I could do you know, in my head, and then I went to a couple of the harder ones, and I worked them out. So I went to see him at 3 o'clock, and the first thing he did was he opened the book, and he, he went right to the chapter I thought he would. He goes, do, do, do question one. And I said, uh, I looked at it, and I just gave him the answer, because it was easy. And he jumped to question four, and that was easy, too, and I looked at it. Then he went down to the one of the last two, which is the two you know I had done. And instead of asking for a piece of paper or anything, I just sort of stared at it and looked at it for a few seconds and gave him the right answer. And he looked at me and said, okay, you don't have to do your homework. Your test will just, you know, count more. So I pulled that off, and I was really happy. I was just jumping inside. But, um, and it never hurt me, I, and I was honest. I really did resent doing the easy, puzzle, uh, the easy questions just for them to review when you know, I'd rather work on the harder stuff. So it wasn't really a lie. Okay. So as a game dev, there's a couple ways. You want to out the grind for yourself, but you also want to out the grind for your players. And one of the ways I do that, and Clutter is considered, <laughs> does this apparently more than any other game that I can find in the casual market, and I get high, high marks from my players that love the game, is I have tons of options. You can play it with quick start. You can play it with quick match. You can turn off the timer. You can turn off the story. Um, if you don't like the tap penalty, you can get rid of that. If you don't like the icons at the beginning of the level, you can get rid of those. Uh, they can play it their way. I am the Burger King of, uh, you know, of, of games. So Clutter is the Burger King of games. It's you have it your way. Okay. Um, I've never had Are You Sure on exit in my game. And I've heard from a few of my players that love that. Love that extra little touch. Um, this is one of the few repeat things I've said in other talks. But are you sure on exit is an insult to the player. And it's just developer's ego going, are you sure you want to leave my game? Why would you want to leave my game? You sure you, you want to do that? And it's an insult. They hit the button. You know, nowadays you have auto save. Nothing bad happens if you let them exit the game. On my game, they can exit immediately anyway, and they pick up right where they left off. So why would I ask them that? And I have no level gatekeeping. I used to. I used to make them do a puzzle three times, lose it three times before I'd let them go on to the next one. But in my games, when your timer goes up, if you're playing with a timer, you get this screen, and you're allowed to continue level right in the middle there, and just goes on without the timer and you can finish it up, but you only get a blue status globe. You can play it again to try to get the green and beat the timer, or you can skip it to the next level. And if you skip it, you get a red, which is an incomplete. And later, later they can go back and, and play it. Okay. I'm gonna check my time here. Okay, good. Um, I repeated these slides just because of how it fits in here. So in one of my talks, I talked about the lottery ticket of time. And that's basically, instead of Netflixing and chilling when you have a spare moment, you do something 
to improve your future. And it might not pay off. That's why it's a lottery ticket. But you could, you know, read a book. You could learn a new skill. You can improve at something. You can imagine your better future. And all of these were lottery ticket time. And the core idea here is everything you do is in preparation for a future that you can't predict. That was so important, I put it in to next game. I put it in my, I don't know if this is the last game of the game before this, but, uh, oh, I think it's two games back. And I tried to get my players, I won't go into the stories of my game, but they've gotten weird over the years. And a couple of years ago for this game, Clutter 12, I took one of my talks that I first gave here um, talking about time and the lottery tickets and stuff, and I, I worked that into let it, telling them. So I sort of did the talk crossed with other things in my game. But I wanted them, you know, that if they really understood this, they also, at any point, you can do something that ups your odds for improving your future. Um, what this also implies, though, is you use your time wisely. You should always be looking for positive opportunities, but the core of this talk is you should also look to avoid negative situations. And you want to lower your tolerance for worse, okay? Something's bad in your life, you ought to be acting quickly. Because the longer you don't act, you know, you're going to regret it later. Especially, every second in a bad situation lowers your odds for finding the better situation. That's true in like romance. If you're stuck with the wrong person, when you're stuck with the wrong person, your odds of meeting the right person really are low. I know it sucks being alone, but really, staying with a bad person, you're not gonna meet the next person. Or if you do, you're gonna meet somebody that, that wants you to cheat and do unethical things and bad things, so that's not good. You wanna free yourself up from the bad situations so the good situations can arrive. It's also true in jobs. I'm not arguing that you should quit your job, but if you're unhappy with the job, start looking immediately. In fact, I believe even if you're happy in a job, you should always be, there's a, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross has always be closing. I believe you should always be looking, no matter if you're happy. But if you're unhappy, it depends. You know, if you're making so low money or something, you'd be better off quitting and look, you know, spending full time looking for your job you really care about. Um, okay. And really, just move on. Don't worry about getting back the people, you know, the bad, you know, just move on. Uh, living, living well is always the best revenge. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute to do my bad analogy. Um, because I was doing the negative, negative equals a positive, and I'm the math guy, the core of this underneath of the subtext is all about how math can improve your life in ways, you know, you don't understand. And I've always hated I've hated people like use the like the uncertainty principle and try to, uh, you know, try to um, say that's why you can't tell somebody you're testing something because it'll, you know, affect the resu results. They'll they'll use wrong reasons from low level science to justify something that don't hold up. But this is going to be me doing it sort of with a with a math bent and letting you know. So here's bad analogy. Does everybody know what compound and simple interest is, right? Compound interest is better because instead of just the incremental improvement, it's the incremental times the incremental, you know, that improves and it goes, it's the curve that goes up as opposed to just linear out. So getting better at many little things is simple interest. Oh, I can do the cube. Oh, I can program in that. Oh, I can do that. But going deep and getting better and better at one thing is more like compound interest because as you're getting deeper into the thing, that thing adds to what you already know on that thing, okay? So it's more like compound interest than learning a bunch of little things everywhere. So going deep, you want to occasionally. Um, so, so doing the one thing deeply. Everybody wants results, but nobody wants to stay focused. Because it's really, we're talking focus. The gap between your current life and the life you want is called focus. And focus 100% on one thing instead of doing five things with 20% focus each. And that's just my advice. You know, everybody has to juggle and do stuff, but you know, that's my advice. Okay. Clutter 
some of those variations in clutter are more like the linear ones because they only work for that thing. But a lot of the clutter variations, when I'm trying to think of them, if I think of a variation that can play well with all the other variations, that's one worth pursuing because it buys me more. It's more bang for the buck. So, um, and it's tough. You know, I created dragging, and dragging works with other things, but some things, some variations, again, play much well with others. For instance, um, black and white. You can take any of my puzzles, almost any one of my puzzles that has color in it, and you can just change it to a black and white, and it's, you know, it's a good, it's a good match. It's a good new puzzle. And that's because black and white, you know, turning it to black and white just works for everything. Something else like, I'm trying to think of a bad example. Oh, fuzzy. I have this puzzle that is just fuzzy. So you, you swipe, the ev everything's faded out, and as you swipe the mouse, things fade in. That's not as good of a puzzle because in that rotation, that's not going to be a good puzzle while everything's rotating. It's not going to be a good puzzle black and white versus color. It's just not. It's not going to work well with anything else. But it's a nice variation as a standalone puzzle. But it doesn't buy me as much because I can't use it as often. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, my franchise effect is also like compound interest. And this is, um, this is all my sales since I started. Um, the only thing to really note here is if I never did a second clutter game, that first game would have made me about 60000 And as you can see, once I did the second game, it lifted it. The third game, you can see the lift going on of that blue at the bottom. And that, that game still brings in about 1000 a month and has earned me about a quarter of a million. But that would not have happened if I did separate games. Would not have happened. Um, and the other thing here is you get to see three slopes. So there's that first flat slope. Let's see if I can point here. Right here, that's really flat. Then three, it really took off for a while and kind of flat again. But, but this is when I went to Unity so I can get games out a little quicker. This is the only thing that keeps me ahead of the shrinking market curve in the casual PC down space. That the customers, you know, every year still get iPads and fancy phones for Christmas and they stop playing on the PC. Okay, and the last one. Learn tools and focus on tools that work together well. Again, a tool that just works by itself is only going to be like, you know, the, the simple interest, but if you get tools and learn how to have the tools work to other tools, then you're more in the, the, com uh, the, the compound safe. Okay, this is another one I put in my, my recent game because I somehow wanted to tell them about my early love of magic and ventriloquism for some reason. Um, magic is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can make anything happen. This is how I've been telling my stories now for, for almost all of Clutter, but they looked a little different in the earlier games. But I got the notion early on that when they finished a level, they would get a picture, they would get a quote, and they would get a story snippet. And they could turn all this off really easily. But this, is, this was the easy way to tell a story for me, and I stick with it. And I think I mentioned that later, but <coughs> getting something that works saves you time, right? As soon as you have something that's good enough and it works, why reinvent the wheel each time? So this, this I can change the specifics already in it. I could even move where the text shows or something, but why? This, they get used to this. Oh, and this is from the help system in my game. You can review the entire story by itself without being in the um, levels that play the game. Okay. The reason I put it in here is I wanted to do this quote. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's Arthur C. Clarke. And I want you to learn and love your tools because you want to be the magician. Okay? You want to know your tools so well that you can do things that just amaze people. You know, and if you can explain it, how you did it with the tool, they go, oh, that was easy. Just like a magician explaining how they did this card trick. Whenever a magician explains a trick, they go, oh, that was easy. And they don't do it. Because but um, same way with your tools. But you want to be the magician. 
Okay. Um, this is another one from my game. And the main point of this is I wanted to explain the main reason I'm still an optimist is no matter how bad things are in your life, you can always look around and say, what can I improve? And not only what can I improve, what's bothering me that I can get rid of? One of my habits that I do when I'm angry at somebody, whether it's my wife, my son, you know, anything, if I notice myself stewing and getting angry or whatever and stuck in my mind, I go do something productive. It might be nothing more than cleaning up, you know, putting the dishes away or something, cleaning up my room. Because it gets me out of my mindset. I do something productive, I feel good, and I don't wallow in, in the crap. So, okay. So a lottery ticket of time that I missed is this talk, outing the grind. Um, so that led me, you know, what else is missing in that, you know, <sighs> want to check my time? Okay, we're good. Um, what else am I missing that's connected to both the lottery ticket and out in the grind? And I had a couple things I wanted to talk about. So in every job I've ever held, when you try to improve yourself at work, your boss doesn't usually want you to. It's usually really hard for them, you know, unless you're lucky, it's hard for them, hard for you to get them to pay you go to learn a new tool, unless it's critical. And they won't send you to a conference unless it's critical. In fact, what they want you to do is they never want to teach you to swim. They want you to tread water faster, okay? But if you took the moment to swim, it would be better for them and better for the future of the company. So early on, I justified, I rationalized. You can tell me whether, whether you think this is horrible or not. But, um, oh, sorry, I need to talk about one other thing before I go. So from day one, as a programmer, they've talked about quick and dirty versus slow and clean. They said those are your only two options. You can be quick, quick and dirty, you can be a hacker, or you can do slow and methodical or whatever. But that's bull. With better techniques and tools or whatever, you can be quick and clean over time. So I never believed that lie. I'm going to come back to that. The 10%, and then I'm going to go back. So at that company that doesn't want me to learn how to swim, I justified that I could steal 10% of my time to work on self-improvement. That I'm not going to tell them because I'm not crazy. I don't want them to get fired. But if I'm going to go read a book on C++, uh, if I'm going to go improve or learn a tool or research something, number one, I was pretty fast as a programmer anyway, so they probably couldn't tell. But I justified if I learned it, it would pay off down the road. So for instance, I learned awk on my own, and sure enough, a few weeks later, I did a project in awk that saved the company, easily saved the company three and a half man months. Because I did it with awk in two two weeks that and they were allocating like four months for the project. And um, if I hadn't learned awk by myself, I wouldn't have learned that I could have used awk to do that. Okay, so that's the 10% having to do with work. Okay, so again, core of the talk. Another time, uh, I have two little stories on how negative one times negative one equals one. Uh, the first two are in basketball here. I hated coaches in, in high school. I, I hate coaches everywhere that only look at the positive. That kid's so fast. That kid's, oh, he dun he's strong, fast, whatever. Yeah, but how many times does he throw the ball away? How many times does it dribble off his foot? Okay? To accurately assess anybody in a sport, you have to take the positive things they do and subtract the negatives, the bad things they do. Okay? I so much believed in this, my coach called me over one day and told me I was hogging the ball too much on the press, that I had to give up the ball sooner when press was happening. And I said to him, I said, have I ever lost the ball in the press? He said, no, not that I can remember. I said, so you want me to give it to big guys while I'm coming up the court so that they can throw it away on the next pass? That's, that's what you want me to do. And he just sort of shook his head. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll keep doing it my way, and the first time I lose the ball in the press, you I'll start doing it your way. And he, he sort of shook his head at me. We, we were friends as well as coach, and he got my point, and he let me 
keep doing it. Okay. Um, right after college, I was still working UPS, working only 20 hours a week, but making pretty good money at the time. I took a second job. I did not take that job to make more money. Does anybody, raise your hand on this one. Does anybody know why I took that second job? Go ahead. No. So what, it, what? No. In the core, in the, it's up here with negative one times negative one. What's equal to make more money? What's the equivalent in the negative? Spend less money, okay? Those quarters represent video game arcade machines. I had so much free time, I was only working 20 hours a week, I had so much free time, I was just spending way too much time at the arcade dumping in quarters. And I took the second job more than anything else, it was just answering phones on a weekend, you know, so I didn't have as much free time. And it sounds odd, but true story. Um, Again, removing a, a negative without any grime, claim you 10%. So we'll talk ab about the 10%. As self-perception, if you have an annoying trait, if you know enough, if you're self-aware enough to know that some things you do annoy people, I'm not asking you to change that. I want you to be yourself. But if you can rein in 10% of whatever annoys other people, you'll learn how to be more successful. I'm a nerd, I'm still a nerd. And I was such a nerd in freshman year in college, I used to wear a little English driving cap and carry an umbrella the whole time. That was a little too annoying, okay? No, that's putting a target on your back. You don't need to put a, you can, you can scale it back that 10% and you'll find out that 10% less is more. You also wanna know your 10%. And you want to know your core, ten, the stuff you won't give up on. And you really want to know that and protect that. That's what you won't sell out. You know, you'll never, you'll never do that. You know, I don't want to salute somebody, even though I came close to being in the Navy one day, you know. But I know my 10%. And you want to protect it. You really do. And that's, again, this, I can't give you specifics on that, but... Um, in my game in Clutter, I went away. In, in, the, in the sixth game, I hired two young kids that were right out of college that did a great job making, making a more beautiful clutter that told a better story that the marketing and publishers liked, but my players said, not enough Jonas. And the next game, I went right back to cranking up Jonas and talking about myself more and weird stuff like that, and it did better. So you got to know, you got to know what your temper, and you really want to protect that. Okay. So this is just, I just wanted to share. You know, I got lucky with clutter. Clutter was not only a lottery ticket of time, it was one that paid off. And it was, the main philosophy was, it was just good enough to get it out the door to see how it would do, and it it came this close to not, I came this close to not doing a sequel, but I'm glad I did because getting the next one out the door led me to see the franchise effect and led me to stick with it. And it's not only a lottery ticket of time, you know, that I invested in, it paid off. I hope you guys are lu as lucky as I am on that. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Uh, ikigai. 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 Is it? I got two Japanese words I wanted to share. This one is, and I'm lucky. I, I really feel like I, I hit Ikigai a few years ago. And I've known about this concept for years. And I, I wish all of you can hit this at some point, where you find a job, you know, what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs. The reason it's here is becoming the curator of clutter sort of pushed me beyond this, that, you know, I realized that having my own digital IP franchise affected me even beyond this concept of how nice it is to feel like I have my purpose. And I wanted to share that. Um, I get all my money from royalties. It's a trip. Some months when I'm on Big Fish and a month, I get a big check. But 
most months it's just it's consistent. And I have enough. I'm not rich, but I'm so glad I'm not working for somebody else. And I don't have, I don't have real money concerns because I live within my, I, you know. And this varied paycheck is, you know, to give you an example, as soon as I get done this talk, I'll probably check my email, and I might have had a direct sale from my own website. Okay, I usually have one or two a day, and it's twenty bucks. And I think of them in my brain. I go ka-ching, you know. It's 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 just a weird effect, you know. And I kiddingly taught. I I kiddingly use it as almost like rolling dice in a twenty. You know, I look and I go, oh, I guess I should have done that because the universe just rewarded me with twenty bucks, because it's that random. And it's just I don't know. It's just another thing to have fun with that I never expected, you know, as a side effect. Um, can't say enough about that, but you guys can all understand what it is, you know. I, various times I create something in my game or think about doing something in my game and I hear one of my bosses or a producer say, you can't do that, Joe. I hear that old voice, which was said to me many times in my life. And now it's, yes, I can. I don't care, because I can do it. Um, it's been challenging dealing with the market pressures, but it's been a fun, it's a, it's a fun challenge. It's, it's nice. Uh, again, franchise keeps me head of the shrink. I'm so grateful for that, but it's kind of fun to see, you know, what should I do next? What, you know, pick and choose. Um, and I take my responsibilities of being a curator seriously. I have fans that if I stopped, they would be let down. They would be disappointed. Um, they're, uh, over 1,500 people have found my website. I'm not allowed to have clicks in my games, but because I brand puzzles by Joe, they found me and they, you know, buy directly from me. And, and not all of them, but a lot of them, but they give me feedback and stuff. And it's a community, and it came out of sort of nowhere. And I really am the curator. I listen to them, and I try to give them what they want. And I've also, it's amazing what longevity does over time especially with my distributors and how they treat me or other business people, just surviving, just surviving a length of time is a noble pursuit. I mean, and you can, I don't say you can leverage it, it's not like I, you, but it's, things are different. They look at you a little differently, right? It's like being a one hit wonder in music versus being somebody by like Elton John or Billy Goat that's been around for years. And I don't know when it is for them. I mean, for some people it's second or third album they start happening, but some people, you know, there's even bands that never have, two or they have small hits, but they've been around 20 years and they're still, now they're touring again because there's longevity, there's something that longevity brings. Okay, so the other Japanese word is, is kaizen, which is constant self-improvement. Um, and it's a fuzzy concept because now it's, they tie it into agile software development, but really it just means continuous improvement. And way back, I think it just meant continuous self-improvement. So I wanted to share a couple things from my game that, you know, as a developer, because I wanted to hit that part. So these, these two things are my config files. Uh, you, you guys would do them, any developers in here would probably do them in JSON. I use a flat file approach. But you can tell, you know, that's hard. You can look at maybe two puzzles at a time and so forth. But just recently, like two years ago, I finally got the brilliant idea to add a semicolon and uh, so put more on the screen. Now I can, you know, this was something that I looked at. It was taking me too long to review a game or go find a puzzle or it's just taking me too long. So I spent some time saying, how could I improve this process? And I'd already spent the time a little bit because this is what this column and row does. I'll have like 100 puzzles but it'll be 10, it'll really be just 10 puzzles crossed with 10 different um, object sets or a couple other parameter tweaks. Um, but anyways, this is all done and it really only took me, it, it took me less than an hour once I got the idea, but it saved so much time. Um, this is my story toggles. <laughs> this is in, this is in, um, they all work by their name. So that story toggle, even though it has story as a title, uh, is probably called story toggle. And just by naming it, it can look in the help file and find out 
that stuff on the right. It knows its default because I've attached a button handler that knows about toggles. And when you toggle it, it either does something because the it just magically happens, or anybody within my program can go if uh, if toggles story toggle is on, you know, do something. And I don't have to do it. I did this after I think I did four of them manually. And when I did four of them, I said, no, I gotta I gotta automate this because I'm gonna I want more and more, you know, um, toggles in my game. So this is just this. So within the game itself, I've had many things where I constantly think of, you know, I don't want my game to be a grind. I mean, sometimes they can play a level for seven minutes, but it's more like three to five. And I used to like, I used to want them to see the old school was hunt, hunt, find, hunt, hunt, you know, a lot of hunting, not much finding. And now it's more like you just find, 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 and occasionally you get stuck. It's a quicker game. Now I still have the old ones represented, but I wanted it more to be, I wanted it to be more Twitch-like without being Twitch, because my, my customers are women over, women over four, 40 to 60 with some disposable income. They're not gonna, they're not like button mashers who are, you know, play console games, right? But I wanted them to have more fun. Um, in my game, one of the rules of thumb, if you don't like a puzzle, the next one will be different, and they all know that. Um, and I keep it interesting and varied. I was going to talk about, again, how do you make dragging fun? Well, the way you make dragging fun is you give them just enough to drag, just enough stuff that doesn't match so that they're not constantly matching. But once they've dragged everything, they've missed a couple matches, and it takes up almost the entire screen. And then they have to find those last few matches. So some people do things like they keep all the reds together, keep all the colors together. You know, they come up with strategies. Um, another way to make dragging fun is on a regular cluttered screen, it might be 50 objects. On a dragging one, it'll be 30, right? There's many ways. And I believe, like I said before, there's no bad mechanic, there's bad level design. A good mechanic, you should be able to, at one end, it's just an activity. It's very simple, a kid can do it. And at the high end, it's really hard, right? And you should, you should be able to make a puzzle from a mechanic at any of, the, of that range. Okay, um, let me check my time, 43 minutes, good. So we're at the kitchen sink, which is just a bunch of ideas. I wanted to quickly just pop up there. I'll take questions on them at the end. Rule of three, third time you do something, automate. First time, first time you might talk yourself out of it. Second time, you might be so pressed for time you go, but you do it a third, you're gonna do it 10 times, okay? Um, Purpose matters. It's totally okay to break the rule if, if you keep it intact. And I believe that in my entire life. Now you don't want to break traffic laws and stuff like that, but if you have a rule about something, you know, people that keep rules and don't know the intent are the worst people in life. You know, my apologies if I insult anybody here. Most, most people that are rule-based that are inflexible don't know that about themselves anyway, so I'm probably not insulting them. But basically, you know, if you're doing something for a purpose and you have this rule of thumb or rule or whatever and the rules get in the way, you can get rid of it, especially in programming. Um, add constraints early. Um, constraints just make the, the task easier. You know, Once I decided this was going to be about math and negative one times negative one and, oh, I can talk about other math things. I almost talked about calculus, uh, slopes of lines. You know, it, it makes it breaks it in. 80-20 rule, get to the 80 quick. Do it quick. Do the easiest first, just like in test taking. When you're taking a test, if you see a hard thing, you should skip it, finish everything, then come back to the hard one. Same way with your work. Uh, the 80-20 rule is the first 80, you know, takes 20% of your time, but you want to be even quicker than that because that last 20 does take 80, you know. You, it, you just want to be quick, get into that 80 because you can lock it in and just stop thinking about it. You want to get to your end stuff. Um, avoid premature optimization. This is mostly in code, but in life too. Don't fix something if it's not broken. Let your task tell you what's critical. Wait, hold off a little bit. Uh, juggling, life's juggling and so forth. In juggling, when you learn to juggle, 
you want to follow the flow of the deck, but you don't want to chase. To, do, to learn juggling wrong, what you do is you try to keep juggling even if, when it's getting away from you. No, what you want to do is let them fall and just pick them up and start again. And that's actually true in life and whatever. Don't chase. In programming, sometimes it's called shaving the yak, I think, where you start out to do one thing and then something gets in the way, so you start solving that, and then, then something else gets in the way and you start solving that, and you end up what they call shaving the yak, which is you're doing something that has nothing to do with your original problem. And there might be a different way to solve your original problem. Worse before bed, I talked about this before, you want to bottom out more quickly. If you're on the tangent that it's going downhill, recognize it and stop it right then. You don't have to wait until you hit rock bottom. You don't. A lot of people do, but you don't. It's, it's smarter if you don't. Um, most people hate losing more than, like, than we like winning. This is true. Use it for your motivation. My motivation in this category is I love proving people wrong. Love it. Joe, nobody will ever buy just a, puzzle, uh, just a collection of puzzles. That's not true. You know, and it motivates. Uh, confirmation bias. You want to learn from the losers and avoid their strategy. Much better than, conf than going after the winners because, first of all, you don't want to engage in wishful thinking because it kills your good luck. It, it, wishful thinking isn't rational, and you're just, you're just throwing it away if you're wishful thinking too much. Um, I think the winning one's next one. So, but was software is forever Legos. They're interchangeable and reusable. And you want to find your one way earlier, early and start building up something you can keep adding to. And that's what's nice about uh, software, and especially like Unity. It's permanent Legos, really. Um, said that before. Listen to your customers that love your game but still complain about something. Ignore the haters. I don't know. I may have lost a slide here. Anyways, so make the assumption of good intentions in both your players and game dev team. Do you know people that get angry too quickly? You know, I had a guy I worked with. I used to go, you know, uh, he, was, he was the epitome of the opposite of this. Is I would say, hey, Lorenzo, that's a nice shirt you're wearing today. And he would go, what was wrong with the shirt I wore yesterday? <laughs> you know, there's people, you know. But I learned that, especially like game devs at other companies, they're just trying to do their job. And maybe something negative's happened at one of my distributors that affects me. But, you know, the people I'm complaining to, they're just trying to do the job too. They're not out to get me. They're not, you know, there's nothing personal there. And same way with the players. Although, s you know, sometimes if you let them down, they really go off the deep end. But mostly the players, when they're giving me negative feedback, is they're just trying to help. Um, and again, this is, this is you don't want to be pr prematurely pessimistic. This is, again, you don't, you don't want to fix problems before they arrive. Let them arrive. So the main point of this talk has been a negative times a negative is a positive. Ooh, I'm almost done. This is great. And um, he was the other inspiration. But it's never been a grind for me because I out the ground e grind each and every day. And that's true. And that's who I am right there. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> any, any questions? Oh, I got one for Mike, though. So how much repeat? Oh, bull, 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 bull. Oh, yeah. I asked Mike uh, how much of this talk was a repeat. He said 75%. He, I believe, was being facetious. Any other questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. So he asked me if I'm hand generating all my puzzles or whether it's procedural. So it's, it is config file. It's all my puzzles are randomly generated off basic configs. So that first puzzle is just normal. Uh, number of objects, number of things in the background, and so forth. And then I have a bunch of parameters like are the background pieces interwoven? Is it, a is it a black and white? Are they split in half? Are they distributed in, in half the screen? How, how interwoven are they 
within themselves? Like, are the matches always sitting on top, which a lot of times they are, but they're also sometimes you have to hunt and so forth. So there's tons of parameters. Then that one slide I showed you, when I do some of the extra, not the main, I have a main 100, 100 level quest that's pretty handcrafted, but then I have other areas that usually take some of the puzzles from the main quest and then will allow you to play them. They might have been played with donuts over there. Over here they can be played with donuts or shoes or hats or whatever. And it's a little more complex than that, but I can get a game out now <laughs> in about six to seven months that has 2,400 puzzles. And some of them, by the way, so I have some picture puzzles that play, I think, over four or five lands. The new pictures are the only, con that's, it's a content thing. I don't have to change anything in those 500 puzzles because I already have a set that lets you, that slider puzzle you saw with the lady, lady in the blue, you know, that can be cut up different ways. That can have black and white in it too. There's, there's many things. So all that changes in the next game is that there's a new picture there. Okay? So there's, there's many ways I, I uh, save time and stuff. Hope that answers. You had a question? Go ahead. For me, uh, again, when I think of a new game mechanic or a, a new variation, it I want it to play well with everything else, and then it influences my level design. Occasionally, while doing the level design, I since I'm a jack of all trades, I'll come up with something that it can't do, that I want it to do. So it's 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 a really tight. Uh, feedback loop. It really is. So it's, you know, I have, they can use Mahjong layouts now. And I didn't put Mahjong in the game. I put Mahjong in the game to have Mahjong tiles play. But then when I realized I could use the Mahjong placement of the tiles and put my clutter objects in them without the rules, I did it. And then once I did that, I realized I wanted to overlap the Mahjong tiles, which you can't do because that wouldn't look good in a Mahjong game. You get what I'm saying? So I went back and affected the Mahjong so that when it didn't have tiles, it could put them closer together and overlap and do other cool things. Right. Right. It goes, it goes back and forth. Usually starting with the new mechanic and then as I'm trying to create interesting puzzles, then it often adds new requirements. And again, I'm the one. one. One of the reasons I'm quick enough is I don't have to explain it to anybody or get anybody's permission. Really, that's death by committee is probably what kills most good game ideas and, and stuff and, and slows the process down. So, any other questions? Yeah, my again, I get I get incredibly high mark. All my levels are replayable. The only ones that aren't is I do some um, quote box puzzles that are based on quotes, and once you play them, they're kind of boring to play again. But every one of my clutter levels is randomly generated, and it's randomly generated to create an interesting puzzle, and um, it'll use the same object set or something, but it won't look like. It, it'll be fun each time. So the answer is is almost every one of my levels is replayable. So uh, now the jigsaw puzzles are replayable in that a jigsaw puzzle is replayable, but but the pieces change. So think think of a jigsaw puzzle that uses the same picture, but every time you play it, it's sh shaped differently. It's the cutouts are different. So it's replayable, but it's not quite replayable as much as the the um, the clutter games are. Any other questions? Go ahead.
So, so Chat GPT wouldn't know. And uh, he asked me, could I use Chat GPT AI to help me? And the answer is, for most of what I do, no, because it doesn't know enough about Jonas and the games and so forth, or even to do the story. But the last guy, I hire occasionally somebody to do things for me. And one of the things, because I've done them too much, is go out to the web and give me 100 new quotes that are inspirational that can be used in my quote box puzzles that are between a certain length and a certain length. And he actually used chat, <laughs> chat TV to not only do that, not only grab them, but then sort them in the order and put them in parameters that my program understood. <laughs> and he gave me that code, which I don't, I haven't really understood yet, but he used it for that. So he did something that usually takes somebody 10 hours to 15 hours, and he got it done in about an hour and a half, and it's reusable. So that's, you know, that's kind of nice. Anything else? I think I'm done anyways on time. Right? Just about. Thank you much. You can find me at Joe Casavar or um, Puzzles by Joe if you want to, um, you know, ask any questions or further co correspond. Um, and I have a card on me if anybody wants that. So thanks. And thanks again, Andrew and, and Rod. I don't think I met. Did I mention you guys' name when I s saw the pictures? I just said those guys. What? Yeah. Anyways, always nice to be back at SimFest.